Hey, good morning, Emmanuel. Welcome to church today. Nate, welcome to church today. Welcome to church, Jake. It's good to be here, church. So we are glad you're here. I'm, we're glad that you're here. Nate's back. We didn't scare him away from pre-service. I, I was worried that we would, but we're glad that he's back. And you had a big weekend. We had a big weekend and a big move. Cleaned out the storage unit. Everything's in our new house. Awesome. Praise God for that. Hey, if you are here this morning, we want to make sure, like every Sunday, that you sign in. If you go on the Church Center app, go to check-in. It's just a couple quick clicks right there. You just say that you're either in person or online because we do have some people joining us online, like always. Welcome to our online campus. We're glad you're here as well. You can sign in too. We want you to sign in as well. And last week, I did mention that Lisa was keeping track and it was reflecting on me how many people signed in. And we did see a bump in sign-ins, fun fact. So I appreciate you backing me up. Lisa said, good job. So all right. if all of you that did it last week could also do it this week, that would be fantastic. That would be great. But hey, we have some announcements for you this morning, starting actually with a celebration of something we were able to do last week. Why don't you tell us about that? Sure, last week we had a celebration for parent appreciation. Uh, we were ha so happy to hold our parent appreciation lunch last week in the cafe and provide a space for the kids to have fun together. As parents were able to meet and learn about the church's vision for the next generation ministries. Thank you to all the families that came out and spent some time with us after service, especially those teens who helped make cotton candy and um, snow cones Tough and work. popcorn. Yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah. It, it was great, the kids and the teens got to have fun. We got to have some awesome time with the parents. It was a great time. Now Nate is preparing for our next announcement because starting this week, you're gonna be able to be in this devotional for I believe it's three months, June, July, August. So this is a free devotional that, that we are gifting to you. You could have picked one up last week. If you forgot, you can pick one up this week. If you're online, reach out to the office. We can make sure you get one. But this is a, the word for you today is what it's called. And it is a devotional for every day, June, July, and August. We, we used the same devotional back in December. Uh, we got one from the same kind of company that gives us these. And so many people really enjoyed it and loved it that we said, all right, let's, let's do it again for the summer. So these are free for you to take and for you to go through. Should I give a little sneak peek? Yes. What are we, we going to talk about? What's June 1st? Is that? June 1st is Wednesday. 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 Nate's got his calendar down better than I do. So Wednesday, you are going to read about a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. That's, that's, that's good. I think a lot of us need to read that one. Oh, that spans over multiple days. Wow. So this is it's really a valuable devotional, and it's free. It's, it's free. It's free. We, we just it's free, love it's for you me. so much. That's exactly it. We want to gift you with this, so grab one. There's also an online version, which I think I forgot to mention last week. So if you go to mydevoapp.com and use the access code EDN, you can get it online as well. So you don't even need a physical copy. You can go online at mydevoapp.com using the access code EDN. Did you know? I don't know, I don't know many things. Did you know that within the Emmanuel family, there are more than 20 countries represented? Wow. In my family, I have Ethiopia and India where our children are adopted from. But to let you know, Sunday, June 5th at noon, here after church at, the Emmanuel, at Emmanuel, come celebrate Asian American Ministries 10th anniversary and join us for a cultural flavors picnic. Bring your favorite country of origin or all American side dish to share as we enjoy diverse food from around the world. Please sign up through the Emanuel app or our homepage. So we hope to see you there. We do. That's gonna be that's gonna be a great time. I'm already preparing Come hungry. for next week. So like for those of you who don't know, like when you prepare for Shady Maple or like the cultural flavors picnic, same thing, right? You gotta eat a lot throughout the week and then prepare the day before by not eating as much so your stomach's expanded to eat a lot. Cause there's gonna be a lot of good food there next week. I'm, this is a week of preparation for that for next Sunday. I cannot wait. Hey, happening in two weeks, so that's next week. The week after that, we are going to be having graduation Sunday. Now this is special to me cause I get to celebrate this with my teens with our graduating high school seniors. If you haven't experienced it here at Emmanuel before, what we do is all the graduating high school seniors, they set out tables in the lobby 
where it just, they put up like some trifolds and you get to see some about their high school experience, some about what they're doing post high school, and you get to just walk around and, and get to know a little bit more about our seniors and, and where God's calling them to next. So it's a really fun Sunday. We'll honor them in service. We'll pray for them in service. It's just a great Sunday to celebrate the achievement of our high school seniors. We'll celebrate all seniors, but specifically our high school seniors who are really taking a big step into this next season of life for them. So in two weeks, that's June 12th, uh, you'll have some seniors here to celebrate with and just to, to bless. So that that's going to be an awesome Sunday. That is June 12th. June 12th is graduation Sunday. And also on Sunday, June 12th, we will be hosting our second annual, yep, you guessed it, Holy Ghost Wiener Roast. Yes. The Wiener Roast will begin at 6 p.m. And we'll start with a time to... If you'd like, eat as many hot dogs as your heart desires. Last year, two teens, Josh Martin and JJ Scott, had a competition and both ate eight to 10 hot dogs. So if you think you can beat them, please come out. Josh will be there to challenge anyone who is brave enough to take on the feat. He's preparing right now as we speak. He, he's, he's like preparing for that, for that night. We will then wrap up the evening with some worship and a word from our own Pastor Jake. Hey, let's make this vent and a blast together and come out for the Holy Ghost Wiener Roast. It's going to be fun. It's going to be a fun night of worship, of fellowship, and of hot dogs. What, what, else, what else could you ask for? You know what they say, where there are hot dogs, the Lord is also. I think that's <laughs> in Galatians somewhere, I think. Something like that. Hey, we are glad that you have joined us today. We've got a lot of stuff coming up, but we are glad that you're here in this moment with us. We've got some awesome worship coming up. We've got a word from Pastor Mark. But before we do, I just want to remind you, if you would like to give today, you know, we, we talk about giving a lot, but what we don't always realize is giving is a form of worship. It's a form Absolutely. of worship to lay ourselves down and to give out of our hearts, to, to give whatever that means. And we, it can mean so many different things. But if you want to give uh, monetarily, if you have a donation to give, you have a tithe, an offering, whatever it may be, there are multiple ways to do that. There are receptacles in the back and one in the lobby if you want to drop off a physical donation. If you want to go online or on the app, um, you can go on there as well. And I always remind, click down that, that tab because it will automatically show up, I believe, tithes and offerings. But yes. there's multiple things that you can give to. We, we are a family at Emmanuel that loves to give to a lot of different places, to a lot of different awesome ministries. So you can find out where else we're supporting in that. But if you want to give today, you have multiple options. You can do so, and we would love it if you did give today. Now, if you're a guest, we always ask that our guests receive before they give. We don't That's want right. you to give. We just want you to receive what we have for you today in service and then go from there. But if you're a guest, don't even worry about it. Just, just enjoy today with this Emmanuel family. And I'm going to pray for our service in our Emmanuel family right now. So why don't you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we are so, so blessed, God. I pray that each and every morning we wake up and we just acknowledge our blessings, God. It's the way to start today because those who know they are blessed are more likely to bless others. When we come from a place uh, of humility and understanding and just thankfulness, God, it changes our day. It changes who we are. So, God, today as we worship, as we hear a word, God, as we rejoice, God, the theme of today is just going to be the word rejoice, God. I, I pray that we would learn what that is and how we can do that even in the midst of difficult times, God. I pray that you would focus our hearts in on rejoicing this morning, God. Would we worship you with all that we have? Would you raise the roof of praise in this house? Would they hear us down the road because we just have to worship your name so loudly, God? Would the voices of this place just lift our spirits and lift worship up to you because it is for you that we are here. It is for you that we worship. So thank you for who you are and for all that you've done. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, Nate, thank you for joining me. You're welcome. And everybody out there, thank you for joining us. And let's worship together. Let's do it. Good morning, Emmanuel. Why don't you stand and join us as we worship the Lord this morning? I'll dance in the shadow of 
with my enemy Cause God is my champion and he fights for me Yes, God is my champion and he fights for me Bigger the battle, greater my faith There is no giant you cannot slay Cause you're stronger than 10,000 armies You're stronger than 10,000 Oh, oh, oh
Psalm 46 begins with these words. God is a safe place to hide, ready to help when we need him. We stand fearless on the cliff edge of doom, courageous in the sea storm and earthquake, before the rush and roar of oceans and the tremors that shift mountains. God fights for us. God of angel armies protects us. And then the last part of verse 46 ends with these words, be still and know that I am God. We're going to carve out some time to just pray together. You may want to pray for people around you. You might want to pray for any number of things. Let me just suggest three. First of all, what's Memorial Day about? This is Memorial Day weekend. Memorial Day is about honoring and recognizing those who have sacrificed themselves that we may enjoy freedom. Some of you have relatives who have paid an ultimate price and we want to acknowledge that and to honor them. Many of you have relatives that are serving in harm's way in different places in the world. And we want to pray for our nation today and for those that are in harm's way. Another national tragedy occurred this week on Tuesday in Texas. I think it would be very appropriate for many of you to just take the next few moments and lift up the family members of those 19 children who have died and the two families of the teachers that passed away as well. But as Psalm 46 says, God is with us in the storms of life. So maybe you're going through your own storm and you just need to know that you can run to God who is our safe place. And so let's take the next few moments and pray together. I'm gonna to ask you if you would just like to 
pray for those in Texas or pray for our nation or pray for your own personal storm, just step out of the aisle. That's the only thing, just step out on the aisle and that'll be your way, your little step of faith of saying, God, I'm here. And I'm being still and knowing that you are God. Allow the Lord to still your heart today. So just take a moment and step out into the aisle. Father, when it feels like there's earthquakes taking place and the seas are roaring and everything around us feels shaky, we come to you for help because you're our safe place. And so right now, that's what we're doing. For those that are in a storm, their marriage is in trouble. Finances are in trouble. Their kids are in trouble. There's trouble at work. Help. We're still, and we're reminded that you are God. You're bigger than any illness, any relationship fracture. You're bigger than depression. You're bigger than cancer. You're bigger than any tragedy. Father, we lift up what took place in Texas this week. And just like we've sung, what our enemy intended for evil, you bring good out of it. We don't know what that looks like at this moment, but bring good out of that horrible tragedy. Bring your people together to be Jesus' arms and feet. We acknowledge today that we are broken, that systems are broken, that our country is broken, and we need revival in our midst to break out. And God, begin it with us. Stir our own hearts to realize that there is nothing that is impossible for you. And as we look to you for help, as we run to you as our safe place, you will meet us at our point of need because we are more than conquerors through Christ. Fill us up again with the Holy Spirit. Fill us up again with hope for the future. And all God's people said, amen. Let's continue to worship.
there's anything that the world needs in a broken space is, is the hope of grace. It's the, it's the space where we as Christians get the chance to actually share the hope of the gospel and the hope of God. And so this, this, this summer, we're gonna provide some opportunities where we actually get the chance, not just to be filled ourselves, but to share the hope of Christ with people that we know, maybe people in our neighborhood, maybe people in this church that you've maybe met before but don't really know. And I wanna invite you this morning, as you enjoy the grace and the goodness of God, to begin to think, what could it be that God wants to do through you in someone else's life? How is it that we can encourage others and in return, we're encouraged ourselves? So this morning, I wanna invite you as you're getting ready to, we're gonna sit down in a moment, we're gonna spend a few moments recognizing some, some people that have passed this year, but all of the things we've talked about this morning point to one thing. The only hope and the only answer is found in Jesus Christ. So we're asking this morning that you might consider if you would um, have some time this summer, we're gonna offer two different times of, of groups in people's homes. You can choose the time to do something, maybe in a coffee shop, maybe in your backyard, maybe on the patio here of the church. But if you've been thinking, I wish I were more connected to some people, maybe this is the time for you to step out and say, I will lead a group. We'll provide you with all of the um, resources, all of the things that you would need to be able to have a conversation about Jesus, about the sermon, about a topic that maybe just strikes you as a way to build friends this summer. So I just wanna give you that opportunity today as you um, think through this morning. In the bulletin this morning, you'll see my information. You could send me, my name is Ann Hansen. I'm one of the pastors here. You could just let me know, text me and just say, I will lead a group and I'd love to start, or even I'll think about leading a group and I'd be happy to talk with you about that opportunity. Aren't you grateful that God brings broken things to life and he uses us in the meantime? Amen. You may be seated. One of the things that we do on Memorial Day weekend is remember those within our church family who have passed away this past year and to honor them. And so this morning in this service, we're going to honor two specific people, Sharon Hummel and Bill Leesner, who have passed away this year. And we have their families that we're going to invite to come forward. So Joel, you want to come up? And I don't know if your daughter wants to come up or not, but please come on up. And then we have um, uh, Linda and her family, if you guys want to come up as well. And we just want to acknowledge them. So we're part of a denomination called the Church of the Nazarene. And we're thrilled to be part of a larger family um, nationally and internationally and one of the things that we do is when we combine resources we always can do more together than what we can separately and so we have a memorial role that we would like to give to you Joel and your daughter um, on Sharon's behalf and we're making a donation to Nazarene missionaries around the world to pay for their health care now I don't know whether you think that that's exciting or not, but listen, if you're in another part of the world and you get in trouble and you need to go to the hospital, it's folks like what we're doing right now that covers all of your medical care and make sure that you're taken care of. And so because of the generosity of you and the Emmanuel family, we're able to do that. So we're making a donation on Sharon's behalf today. And also, Linda, would you like to, uh, Jung Mo, give her this certificate as well? And we want to honor uh, Bill. And Linda said to me today, today is very special because 20 years ago to the day, Bill and her met at this church. And so this is their 20th anniversary of meeting. And then 
of course, they fell in love and they got married and um, they have a lovely family. And this is, this is Lauren right over here. Yeah. Um, so we just praise God for um, these two families. And I just want to pray a blessing over both of you, okay? Father, today we remember that we are links in a chain. There are many people who have gone before us and there'll be many people who will come after us. And it is our privilege to seize our moment of not just walking with you, but being faithful to you and serving you. And so, Father, today we lift up um, Sharon's family and we lift up Bill's family. And with warm hearts, we know that both of them see you face to face and are rejoicing today because they have not only received their reward but have deep intimate fellowship with you so please bless these families in the name of christ i pray amen now the names of sharon and bill are going up on this plaque and that plaque is always in our chapel and so maybe you didn't know that but if you want to go to the chapel after the service and look at all the people that are part of the memorial role as a result of being part of the emmanuel family i really want to encourage you to do so so thank you god bless you brother god bless you linda blessings thanks For the month of May, we've been in a series called Minecraft, Learning to Think Like Jesus. And we've been looking at four biblical principles of what it means to change our minds. You ever change your mind? I want to go to Applebee's. No, I don't. I want to go to Bertucci's. No, wait a minute. Let's just go to Panera's. Okay, let's get a hot dog at Costco. We change our minds all the time. What's it mean to change your mind? in order to think the way Jesus thought. That's what this series has been about. We've looked at the replacement principle, the renew principle. Last week was the reframe principle. And I want to close out this series by talking about the rejoicing principle. So turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 16. I'll begin reading in verse 16. And hold on to yourself. I'm going to read 24 verses. So I'm not going to ask you to stand. Because it may be too much for you. You may fall over. You may go to sleep and knock the person next to you. But the reason why I'm going to read all 24 verses of this event that took place in the Apostle Paul and Silas's life is because it would take me longer to explain the event than it is to just read it for you. Does that make sense? So here's my thought. I think that you should close your eyes and just listen to this story as long as you promise not to go to sleep. Acts chapter 16, verse 16. One day, as we were going down to the place of prayer, who's the we? Luke, Timothy, probably several other people, and Paul and Silas, the main characters in this story. We were going down to the place of prayer. We met a demon-possessed slave girl. She was a fortune teller who earned a lot of money for her masters. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God, and they have come to tell you how to be saved. This went on day after day until Paul was so exasperated that he turned and said to the demon within her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and instantly, it left her. Her master's hopes of wealth were now shattered, so they grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them before the authorities at the marketplace. The whole city is in an uproar because of these Jews, they shouted to the city officials. They are teaching customs that are illegal for us Romans to practice. Is that true? 
it's not. A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas, and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. The Greek word is scourged. Do you know somebody else who was scourged? Jesus. They were severely beaten and they were then thrown into prison. The jailer was ordered to make sure that they didn't escape. So the jailer put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in stocks. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and, pray and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening. Suddenly, there was a massive earthquake and the prison was shaken to its foundation. All the doors immediately flew open and the chains of every prisoner fell off. The jailer woke up to see the prisoner, uh, prison doors wide open. He assumed that the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself. Why would he do that? Because listen, in Roman times, if a jailer allowed any of his prisoners to escape, the penalty was death. And so it was better for him to commit suicide than it was for him to die at the hands of the Romans. But Paul shouted to him, stop, don't kill yourself, we're all here. The jailer called for lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everybody in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and all who lived in his household. Even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. Then he and everybody in his household were immediately baptized. He brought them into his house and set a meal before them. And he and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. The next morning, the city officials sent the police to tell the jailer, now let these men go. So the jailer told Paul, well, the city officials have said you and Silas are free to go. Go in peace. But Paul replied, they have publicly beaten us without a trial and put us in prison, and we are Roman citizens. So now they want us to leave secretly? Certainly not. Let them come themselves to release us. Little attitude there. When the police reported this, the city officials were alarmed to learn what Paul and Silas, that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. So they came to the jail and apologized to them. Then they brought them out and begged them to leave the city. I'll get to the part at the end of the message of why they begged them to leave the city. When Paul and Silas left the prison, they returned to the home of Lydia. There they met with the believers and encouraged them once more. Then they left the city. What on earth are we supposed to take out of this passage of Scripture? I mean, this is the rejoicing principle, and yet the word rejoice is only found in verse 34, and it has nothing to do with what the Apostle Paul and Silas were going through. It has to do with the fact that the jailer and his family rejoiced that they knew Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And yet I want to tell you that this passage of Scripture, this story about Paul and Silas has everything to do with rejoicing. It's the main theme of the story. How can I say that? Two reasons. The first is the location. It was in a city called Philippi. Paul would a few years later write a letter to the Philippians, and it was known as the letter of joy. When Paul looked back on this event, he did not have PTSD. He had PTLD. Praise the Lord daily. You know why? Because it was this event that created an open door in Philippi 
for people to come to Christ. They, in other words, the, the church in Philippi had a level of respect that they hadn't had before, and nobody was going to touch them because of this story of Paul and Silas and being Roman citizens and what's all that about. But the reality is, is that Philippi didn't experience the level of persecution that other cities experienced because of this event. And the church prospered there. And so when Paul looked back a few years later on this event, all he could think about was, praise God that this happened. There's a second reason why this story is really about rejoicing. And it's found in the ten words on which this entire story turned. Here are the ten words. Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. These are the most important 10 words in all of the 24 verses. Because we're meant to ask this question when we read this story. How did you do it, Paul? How could you be holding a worship service in the middle of being in jail, naked, scourged, humiliated, publicly scorned, how can you do that? How do you do it? The assumption in America is this. I can only rejoice when everything is going right in my life. That's not true at all. You can live with two opposite feelings at the same time. You can be sad yet rejoicing. You can be going through great heartache and yet rejoicing in God. You can be going through a financial depression. You could be going through a bankruptcy. You could be going through a divorce. It doesn't mean that you're happy, happy, happy. It does mean that deep on the inside of you, there is a joy in Christ that no one can take away. And that's exactly what this scripture passage is about. Yes, the Apostle Paul and Silas are under dire circumstances. I mean, you and I would fall apart probably if we experienced what they experienced. And yet in the middle of it all, we see them singing, A mighty fortress is our God. How do you do that? That's the question before us this morning. How do you rejoice in good times, but especially in difficult circumstances? Still being connected to reality, still feeling your feelings, still going through deep waters and acknowledging them as going through deep waters, but how do you maintain a level of rejoicing in the middle of it all? To answer that question, I think it's really best to ask three questions of this text. The first is, what does it mean to rejoice in God? Rejoicing is simply this, being happy in God because of who he is and what he's done regardless of outward circumstances. Some of you are saying easier said than done. I know. That's why you have to learn it. It's not natural for us to rejoice in the middle of difficult circumstances, but not only is it possible for the Christian, it's normal. It's being happy in God for who he is, his character, and what he's done, regardless of outward circumstances. We use phrases like this, well, praising God, glorifying and magnifying the Lord, worshiping the Lord. All of these are rejoicing terms. Psalm 34, 1 through 3 says, I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak of his praises. I will boast only in the Lord. Let all who are helpless take heart. Come, let us tell of the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. What a great start to a psalm. But you know what the last verse of that psalm says? The righteous person faces many troubles, but the Lord comes to his rescue each time. The Lord redeems those who rescue, who serve him. In other words, you have somebody on your side. 
You're not alone to face your own problems. God promises to come to your rescue. And that's exactly what Paul and Silas were doing. Listen, they were rejoicing in God. They were holding a worship service. They didn't have a piano. They didn't have an organ. There's no choir. There's no worship team. There's no guitars. There's no drums. There's no praise singers. There's no AVL. And yet they were rejoicing in the goodness of God. Listen, rejoicing is an attitude of the heart that you're happy in God regardless of the storms going around you. Question two, what can you rejoice about, especially when you're going through hard times? You know, I've been asking myself this question as for the last three months, um, Holly and I, our own lives have been in turmoil because of the um, accident that our daughter went through in the beginning of March. And I've been thinking about what is there to rejoice over the last couple months for Holly and me? Let me just give you a partial list. Our daughter is alive and expected to make a full recovery. June 5th, she will go to the doctor, and there is every indication that the doctor will release her from all restrictions. All bones that have been broken are healed, and that she will move on with her life. We've been able to see our grandkids a lot more, right? We were in two-week cycles there for a while. Two weeks we're home, two weeks we go out, two weeks we're home, two weeks we go out, and we're just, and we're just hanging out with our family and, and doing everything, trying to maintain a couple homes at the same time. In the middle of all that, we got a chance to put our grandchildren to bed, read them bedtime stories, go for long walks. We've seen lots of our grandchildren. On the long drives back and forth, I've been able to feed my mind by listening to audiobooks and podcasts, as well as spending hours in silence just praying and being in God's presence. Holly and I have been rejoicing for the many prayers, cards, notes, texts, phone calls, gas cards, restaurant cards, and meals that you have graciously provided for us in the midst of our craziness. Your names are on our lips as we give praise to God. Thank you. I got COVID in the middle of all this. I had to quarantine for five days. I loved every minute of it. <laughs> I couldn't go anywhere. I missed a Sunday. I watched online, eating a bowl of cereal in my pajamas and thought I could get into this. No, I can't, I'm the pastor. I slept a lot, I read, I went on walks. I shared a couple weeks ago about the back pain that I had for a month, and after I told the story about going to the chiropractor and him cracking me because of a frozen pelvis, I was like, is that a woman thing? I, I don't know, I've never heard of a frozen pelvis before, is that okay? So immediately after I preached that message a few weeks ago, I started, my, my phone started blowing up. Who's your chiropractor? <laughs> right? So I'm giving away. I mean, I should, get a, I should be free for the next six months. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I've given so many business to this chiropractor. It's unbelievable. Every time I go in, did you tell that story, Mark, in public service? Right? Because I have another client. Right? So here's what I think. I praise God for my 30 days of pain because multiple people have found relief because I've shared my experience. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm rejoicing in the little ways that God has shown up. Back to Emily for a moment. A couple weeks after Emily got home, she was bound and determined to go to a Jurassic Park exhibit at the Expo Center in Erie. She had bought tickets for the family, you know, before her accident. And Holly was there. I was home. And Holly said, do you really think that's a good idea, honey? I mean, you're just home from the hospital a couple weeks. Mom, I've got my own family now. Okay. Hey, how many of you know your adult kids? Prayer is the main key, right? <laughs> I'm just telling you. You can't tell your adult kids what to do. Okay? And so... 
they put Emily in the car and put the wheelchair in the back and her leg is sticking out really far and they were late to the expo exhibit and Trevor got pulled over by a state policeman for speeding. State policeman walks up to the car, looks over and says to Emily, I was there at the accident. And starts crying state policeman, and says, we all thought you were dead. Holly's in the back, thank you for saving my daughter's life. (laughs) It was just a little God moment, you know what I'm saying, where God showed up. Trevor didn't even get a speeding ticket. (laughs) Praise God, you know what I'm saying? Now, why have I spent the last few minutes just talking about personal things? Because in every situation, especially the difficult ones, if you have an eye to see and ears to hear, you'll always be able to find things to rejoice in in the middle of challenging times. Paul and Silas found three reasons to rejoice in the middle of their bleak circumstances. Number one, they rejoiced that they were being persecuted for knowing Christ. They had been counted worthy of being persecuted because of the name of Christ. It's in Acts 5.41 all over again. The apostles left the high council rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. Millions of Christians all around the world are persecuted simply because they name the name of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And they are in a long pathway of people who have been counted worthy to be persecuted because they knew Christ. Second, they rejoice because of God's continual presence. You can get through anything if you know that God is with you. Joshua heard God say, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Moses heard God say, Exodus 33, 14, I will personally go with you and I will give you rest. Elijah heard a still small voice in the middle of his own self-pity party and depressive episode where there was an earthquake and there was a big fire and there was all these big things taking place, but God wasn't in any of those things, but there was a small voice that prompted Elijah to come out of a cave. Jesus met with his father in the Garden of Gethsemane and was strengthened to go to the cross to bear your sins and mine. Paul and Silas knew the same truths that millions of people have discovered before them and billions of people have discovered after them, and that is this. God's presence in your life is enough. It's not Jesus and. Sometimes it's just Jesus. And he's enough. They also praised God and found rejoicing through what God was doing through them. Notice the words and the other prisoners were listening. They couldn't believe their ears. You see the situation, right? I mean, you're in prison, you're looking at these two guys that are praying and praising God and holding a worship service and singing hymns, and you got to be like, okay, what are they on? And whatever they're on, I want it too. People are watching you and me. They're watching how you handle adversity. It's okay to feel your feelings. It's okay to go through deep valleys. It's okay to experience all the emotions that go through deep valleys. Many of the Psalms are laments. We should be lamenting as a nation. It makes sense to be doing so this week. And yet people are still watching. You've got these guys that are looking over at Paul and Silas thinking, what are they thinking? What do they know that I don't know? What do they have that I don't have? Who do they know that I don't know? 
And this provides Paul and Silas with an opportunity to share Jesus. There is no coincidence that at that very moment, a massive earthquake takes place. And this massive earthquake breaks all of the chains and releases all of the prisoners and the chaos begins to break out, (coughs) excuse me, begins to break out and the jailer comes down and the jailer's ready to kill himself because he just assumes that everybody has run away and Paul says, stop, you don't need to do that. You've got a family. We're all here. Can you imagine what it must have been like for Paul and Silas to talk all the other prisoners into staying? And then Paul and Silas unload a message of hope. And they basically say this. You want to know how we can rejoice in the middle of this horrible circumstance? Remember, they're naked and they've been scourged. Let me tell you about Jesus. And that message was so compelling to not just the prisoners, but the guy who owns the jail and his family. He brings everybody down, brings everybody. Come on, kids, come on. we're going to hear this about, about Jesus, this Jesus person. That there's a mass conversion that takes place at like 12 30, 1 o'clock in the morning. You know why we can rejoice in difficult times? Not just because God is always with us, but God is always working through us. And if you have eyes to see and ears to hear, you will see what God is doing through you. Three, third question. What happens inside of you when you commit to the rejoicing principle, when you just decide that you're going to be a person who rejoices in God, good times, bad times, high times, low times, the valley of the shadow of death on top of the mountain, three things will happen. First of all, you gain a better perspective on life. I had a mentor say to me one time, the difference between leaders and followers is perspective. The difference between leaders and better leaders is better perspective. Perspective is everything. Listen to Paul's perspective in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. <clears throat> For our present troubles are small. Really, Paul? Because I think they're pretty big. No, nope, perspective. For our present troubles are small and will not last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at troubles that we see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things that we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. The most beautiful and expensive diamonds are the ones that have been cut the most. Think about that. The most beautiful and expensive diamonds are the ones that have been cut the most. They have the most facets, and they shine the brightest. God is producing glory in your life. You ever wonder what that word glory means? Oh, the glory of God. Well, guess what? Paul is saying that there's a glory that's being worked out in us. What is that glory? None other than the presence of the Holy Spirit himself. In other words, God's glory is flowing through you, and you begin to shine, and people begin to say, what is it about her? What is it about him? I'd be on the floor in a fetal position if I went through what they went through. Paul, how did you do it? How can you not only survive but flourish and rejoice? Perspective. Second, you become a more compassionate and gracious person. When you have a rejoicing mindset, You actually become more compassionate and gracious. Verses 38 and 40, when the police reported this, the city officials were alarmed to learn that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. So they came to the jail and apologized to them. Then they brought them out and begged them to leave the city. When Paul and Silas left the prison, they returned to the home of Lydia. There they met with believers and encouraged them once more. Okay, what's going on in this story? It's a little weird, right? It feels like Paul's being a little uppity. 
like you did this to us publicly and now you want us to like skirt away privately. It feels like the Apostle Paul has a little bit of an attitude. Actually, it's quite the opposite. These verses that I've just read are some of the most kind, gracious, and compassionate verses in the New Testament, and here's why. Did you know that it was illegal and punishable by death to scourge a Roman citizen without trial? So when Paul and Silas were beaten up, stripped, scourged without a trial and thrown into jail, completely illegal. And Paul, as a Roman citizen, and Silas, who was as well, had every right to have all of the city council executed on the spot. That was their right. But Paul learned a long time ago that you don't get very far in your life pushing your rights. In fact, what he discovered is this. To love your neighbor as yourself is the most compelling thing that you can possibly do and it actually creates an atmosphere of safety and compassion and graciousness so that people are drawn to you and they're drawn to the gospel because you have your rights and you can do certain things to people, but you decide not to because you love Jesus. People who have eyes to see and ears to hear and live in an attitude of rejoicing and choose to follow the 105% principle. I said it in the second hour last week, but I forgot to say it in the first hour. You know what the 105% principle is? You take the 5% that's going right and you blow it up to 100%. And that's what you make your focus. Because if you focus on the 95% that may be going wrong, you'll never be able to see the opportunities that God is giving you. Which leads us to the third way that rejoicing changes us. It makes you more available to be used by God. Rejoicing changes the way that we see life. Imagine if Paul and Silas said when the earthquake happened, come on, let the jailer kill himself. Let the prisoners escape. Come on, Silas, let's get out of here. What a crummy city Philippi is for treating us like this. We're never coming back here again. But they didn't say that, did they? When they had opportunity to leave, they talked all the other prisoners into staying. I don't know how you do that, by the way. And it resulted in a little mini revival in the middle of the night. In every hard thing, you have an opportunity to see it a different way. And if you stay in an attitude of rejoicing and praising God, you will see how God is at work all around you. So every week I've been encouraging you to take a next step by giving you some homework. For those of you who don't like the word homework, that's totally fine. Call it an activation step of faith. Is that better? Here's, here's the activation step of faith for this week. Every day, make a list of 10 things to rejoice in. Every day. Every day, get out a sheet of paper, let a three by five card, just notebook paper, whatever it is, and just write 10 things you're rejoicing in. So here's mine today. I was given another day to enjoy my family and fulfill my calling. I rejoice in that today. I have been called to pastor and preach, and I love it. Two, Holly. So I got a text this morning. Holly is up with our daughter, Emily, and her family and um, spending Memorial Day weekend with them. 
and Holly sent me a text this morning and said, I love you and I can't wait to see you tonight. And I thought, she's even talking to me. <laughs> After 38 years, she talks to me and it seems like she loves me. My relationship with my daughters, son-in-laws, and my grandchildren. Holly and I enjoy a warm relationship with our children and grandchildren. Not a day goes by where we are not texting each other back and forth or sending little silly Instagram posts trying to make each other laugh. I rejoice in that. I rejoice that, uh, I rejoice that I have a Bible that instructs me and corrects me and guides me. I rejoice that I have the Holy Spirit inside me to guide and comfort. I rejoice that our kitchen is being remodeled. We ordered the cabinets in November and they came in last week. I rejoice at the friends that I have that enrich my life, particularly the church staff. You need to know that we have the strongest church staff we've had in 15 years. And they are so much fun. And I feel privileged that they allow me to offer leadership as fallible as they know that I am. I thank God for you. I love you. I hope you never get tired of hearing me say that, but I love you, every one of you. And I take the church directory and I go down through the church directory and I pray over you. By name, your families. And I rejoice in you. I praise God for my health. I take one little medication, 10 milligrams of Simvastatin, just to keep my, my LDL in line. That's it. And I just praise God. Okay, listen, that's just my list. I hope you don't think that I'm just making this about me. I, I, the reason why I wanted to share that with you is, is that it's just that simple. You don't need to come up with big, high things in order to rejoice. Why don't you just keep it really small and on your level? Just the everyday stuff of life. If you were to write out Every day, 10 things you rejoice in. By the end of the week, I think you'd feel better. You'd see things that you didn't see before. So here's my question to you. What do you have to rejoice in? Holy Spirit, give us the mind of Christ in this area of rejoicing. And help us, Lord, to take the 5% and blow it up to 100% so that we can be like you in our attitude and experience you working through us and using us in our everyday life. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
thank you for being the foundation on which we can build our lives. God, we recognize that you are working on us and in us and through us. So allow us to have the vision and the sight to see the ways in which you are working, to see the ways that you are working on others around us, to allow us to have the grace to give to others, the same grace that you give us. Allow us to learn how to love and grow in community draw near to each other as we draw close to you. We love what we see when we're with you. So God, be with us this week, this month, this year, as we walk towards what you have for us. God, build your kingdom here. love you. We praise you. And we thank you again and again and again. All God's children said, amen. Hey, go in peace. Love God and serve others.